This week on Airborne, the FAA publishes new crew rest and duty rules after years of promises to do so. A petition to dismantle TSA gets an official response, and we'll look at those who innovated this year despite the recession. I'm Ashley Hale, welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. Just after he was sworn in in 2009 as the FAA Administrator, Randy Babbitt told a crown at Oshkosh that a new science-based set of flight crew duty and rest rules was his top priority. Ironically, it didn't happen until he was gone from the job. The FAA this week published new rules intended to reduce the likelihood of fatigue causing accidents. Among the highlights, they vary duty time limits within a range of 9 to 14 hours, depending on what time the pilot's day begins, and actual flight time to 8 or 9 hours. Minimum rest periods rise from 8 hours in the old rules to 10 hours, with a separate requirement that rest periods must accommodate at least 8 hours of actual sleeping time. There are new weekly and 28-day limits on cumulative flight time and a requirement for 30 consecutive hours off per week which is up 25% from the old rules. Airlines will be held accountable for determining pilot fitness and are expected to include commuting time in their assessments. The FAA claims the changes will cost the industry almost $300 million, but produce offsetting economic benefits. Mind you, the NTSB has tried quite aggressively to suggest that this should have been an FAA priority for the last several years. Still, Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood calls the changes a major safety achievement. Get much more detail in the text version of this story dated December 21st at aero-news.net. A TBN 700 single-engine turboprop crashed in the median on Interstate 287 in Harding, New Jersey, Tuesday morning, and all five people on board lost their lives. NTSB says that the pilot discussed icing conditions with a controller. ATC recordings captured a pyrep from an airline pilot discussing heavy icing at 17,000 feet. Some witnesses report unusual attitudes and what looked like aerobatics as the stricken aircraft came down. A wing which may have separated in flight was found in a tree a quarter mile from the wreckage of the fuselage. a and will follow the investigation. In the meantime, if you're flying anywhere with your family over the holidays, especially with all the seasonal weather, please be careful. Avidine says it has received TSO and SDC approval of its DFC-90 autopilot for Integra-equipped Piper PA-46 Matrix and Mirage aircraft, and for the DFC-100, and Matrix is equipped with Release 9. Get more details and surprisingly affordable list prices in the text version of this story dated December 19th at aero-news.net. The ownership of Piper Aircraft has quietly been transferred to one of the world's wealthiest men, the Sultan of Brunei. The previous owner, Singapore-based holding company Impromis, says matter-of-factly on its website, quote, we divested our interest in Piper Aircraft and Piper Capital in October 2011. The changes apparently occurred as Piper was shuffling its management in mid-October. Simon Caldicott replaced Jeffrey Berger as CEO, and Executive VP Randy Groom left the company. At the time, Caldicott told ANN he was not at liberty to say what had led to the reorganization. Politico reported this week that the Obama administration has a short list of foreign names to replace Randy Babbitt. ANN's Paul Plack looks briefly at their resumes and what each might mean for general aviation. Among the four candidates mentioned by Politico, Michael Huerta is in the job temporarily now, trying out, and he's proven he can make it through the Senate confirmation process. But his master's is in international relations. He has experience at the executive level managing ports, not really an aviation guy per se. NTSB Chairman Deborah Herzman has come down really hard on the FAA on some safety issues, but if she gets there and has to lead the FAA, she'll have to consider cost and not just benefit. Dwayne Wirth is a career airline guy with a resume a lot like Randy Babbitt's. He even succeeded him as president of the Pilots Union in 1999. But Randy Babbitt turned out to not be a friend of GA on a number of issues, so does that background really mean anything? And Robert Herbert? He's the guy who advises Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid on transportation policy. 
Did that advice in 2011 include spending most of the year bashing aviation as the realm of fat cats? It's hard to find a champion here for general aviation. Hopefully we'll at least find somebody who doesn't treat us like Part 121. For Airborne, I'm Paul Plack. You're watching Airborne. More in a moment. Redbird Skyport is a multifaceted aviation laboratory charged with developing innovative solutions to the issues facing the industry. It started out as a vision for a laboratory where we could objectively measure the systems and the processes that we were developing. Being able to put some objective measures behind the anecdotal evidence that we have about the value of motion and the application of this technology is very, very important because until we can objectively measure it and play that data back, we can't design training systems that make the best use of it. For more information about Redbird flight simulations, as well as Redbird's new Skyport, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com or www.redbirdskyport.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website, or a podcast, send us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. Colton Harris Moore, who became known as the Barefoot Bandit, has been sentenced to over seven years in state prison for his two-year crime spree. He still faces federal charges, but is expected to serve any resulting sentence concurrently. He pleaded guilty to dozens of charges stemming from his run from authorities, which began in Washington State and involved at least five stolen airplanes. The Washington Examiner reports the judge took into account a childhood spent with an alcoholic mother and a string of convict boyfriends in determining his sentence. Harris Moore reportedly has been offered a movie deal which will pay $1.3 million in restitution to his victims. Just when it looked like affordable digital charts would revolutionize general aviation cockpits, the FAA's Aeronav division wants to hit e-chart providers with new fees. Annan's Tom Patton has more. Regardless of the implications of what's known as a shade meeting under federal sunshine laws by specifically and pointedly not inviting media coverage, we're learning that the FAA and its chart source company Aeronav are pretty much adamant that a service that up until now had been provided at no charge, other than what we already pay in taxes, should be a new revenue stream for the government at the expense of the aviation community. Currently, software developers like ForeFlight and WingX are able to use chart information generated by the government in their applications at no charge, making a wealth of data available to pilots on handheld devices. Airlines, too, are moving increasingly to the use of electronic flight bags, saving tons of paper, not to mention pilots' backs. But the Aeronav proposal would place a hefty and poorly defined per-user fee of up to $250 on the use of the charts. They say that declining paper chart sales have run up a $5 million shortfall as more pilots take advantage of the free electronic charts easily accessible on portable devices. But the bottom line from both is that their business models are not sustainable if the current Aeronav plan is put in place, and price increases would be inevitable. It would seem, Ashley, that once again the federal government is looking to the aviation community as something of a bottomless ATM from which it can constantly extract money at the expense of innovation that makes flying safer for everyone. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. Keep an eye on the sky. Yet another satellite is about to make an uncontrolled re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, with no idea where it will ultimately come down. Russia's failed Phobos Grunt Mars probe weighs about 14 tons, but most of that is fuel, and Roscosmos says 20 to 30 pieces weighing a total of 440 pounds or less are likely to reach the ground sometime around the middle of the month. So if someone tells you to duck, don't argue, just do it. Last year, SpaceX became the first commercial company ever to successfully return a spacecraft from orbit. Based in part on the confidence inspired not only by the achievement, but the precision with which it was executed by SpaceX, NASA has greenlighted combining the next two test phases of the unmanned SpaceX Dragon spacecraft into a single flight. 
Dragon is scheduled for a February 7th launch and will perform operations in the vicinity of the International Space Station. If all goes well, the capsule will dock with the station, allowing astronauts to open Dragon and unload cargo. Dragon will then return to Earth within a day or so, and the SpaceX recovery crew will meet it at Splashdown in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of California. A satellite belonging to a Colorado company has captured an image of China's first aircraft carrier during sea trials off the Chinese coast in the South China Sea. Digital Globe Incorporated posted the image on its website. The Chinese government purchased the hull of the ship from Ukraine in 1998 and is thought to be reverse engineering the ship with an eventual goal of producing its own carriers, but operational capability is thought to be several years away. In just a moment, EAA's Rod Hightower looks for ways to put aviation back into the dreams of kids. I'm Ashley Hale and you're Airborne on Aero TV. The DFC-90 all-digital attitude-based autopilot delivers significant performance and safety improvements over previous generation systems. Its innovative flight envelope protection guards against autopilot-induced stalls and the straight and level mode provides one-button recovery from unusual attitudes for an added measure of safety. Immensely popular within the Cirrus community, the DFC-90 is now being made available for a growing list of aircraft including Piper Matrix and Mirage, Cessna 182s, and Beach Bonanzas and Barons. Fly with confidence. Fly with DFC-90. Thanks for joining us. It's time for this week's barnstorming commentary. Guest contributor Rod Hightower, president and CEO of the Experimental Aircraft Association, wonders what will inspire future aviators and what EAA's role might be. Rod, it seems every year recently in GA has been a challenging one, but as we look forward to 2012, what are some of the key issues that EAA sees as things we have to face in general aviation in GA? It's a great question. It's a big question. The way I would answer it, Dick, is I would frame it up in, in maybe three general areas to think about. First is the economic impacts. We're in a time in the economy that is having an unfavorable impact across all of aviation. It's become expensive to fly. Avgas is expensive, jet fuel is even more expensive. You're finding out that it is true impact and it requires a strong commitment to deal with the financial constraints and the financial implications of flying today, no question about it. The second impact has to do with regulatory and legislative issues. So for example, the regulatory issue is an important one for aviation. It is a regulated activity. You have to have some type of a certificate to fly, and rightfully so. But that nonetheless requires time and money commitment ambition, and sometimes it requires quite a substantial amount of resources to be able to complete your certification process. So I think the third element of it is what I call inspirational and aspirational. Out in the general populace, you know, when some of us were young and some of us were kids, the space program was going strong in the 60s, and I mean the achievement that this country was after was amazing and inspiring and aspirational, right? We wanted to, well, boy, you were right there. They were in your living room in the 60s, going to the moon and landing and walking on the moon. That was pretty cool. And, and even before that, it was things such as Sky King and the military activity that was underway was celebrated and talked about in the general populace in a way that I thought was very impactful and would lead people to flying and explore aviation. And certainly before that time frame, the impact of World War II and what that really meant to the generation of pilots in this country. Those things are different today. They're still there. It just looks a little bit different. But it seems to me that there's probably not enough of it there. So the aspirational aspects of becoming involved in flying, whether it's flying or building or buying, the aspirational aspects look a little bit muted right now. Now there's some interesting things that are out there. The aviators program is out there in the PBS world. You have ice pilots, you know, you have Flying Wild Alaska. So some of those things are, are, are good examples of, of catching the imagination of the general population, introducing them to aviation, I think we need to do more, and I think we need to do some substantially more work in the aspirational aspects of getting people involved in aviation. An online petition created on the White House's We the People site calls for the dismantling of the TSA. And surprise, it's one of the most popular petitions on the site. After it drew more than 30,000 signatures, 
TSA Chief John Pistole has responded on the agency's official blog. He says, quote, over the past 10 years, TSA has strengthened security by creating successful programs while also taking steps whenever possible to enhance the passenger experience. If you can't believe he actually said that, read Pistol's full statement for yourself, go to blogs.tsa.gov and scroll down. It's close enough to the end of 2011 to start thinking about what the year has meant. ANN's editor-in-chief Jim Campbell looks at aviation companies which have found ways to innovate despite a tough economy. Thanks, Ashley. As we finish up 2011, we're going to be talking over the next few weeks about the things that went right and went wrong. But let's first talk about the folks who chose to take some risks, the folks who innovated, the folks who led, the folks who really made 2011, well, not a winning proposition, but a lot less of a loser than it might have been otherwise. I've got 15 on my list. Tell me if you agree. First of all, Aircraft Electronics Association. The small association does more with a small staff than any group I've ever seen. I'm incredibly impressed with them. Aspen Avionics, number two. Unbelievably great product line, a product line that had no concept, no idea, no existence previous to this just a couple of years ago. And they have built a niche market like you've never seen, especially in retrofit extraordinary company. Avidyne, they've made usability as well as capability foremost for them. They've just been absolutely amazing. I couldn't be more pleased to see them in our industry. Diamond Aircraft, they've got a great product line, possibly the most comprehensive product line right now in GA. They're still trying to make progress. They've certainly got their nose rubbed into a few things, but they keep working. They keep trying. Eclipse and Sikorsky, they took an amazing concept that boy stumbled big time, brought it back, and it looks like the best days of Eclipse are ahead of it. Four Flight Wing X, the software engineering these two companies have done, the capabilities they brought to cockpits, unparalleled. Amazing companies, and the best part is they compete with each other, keep beating each other at one feature after another. We all benefit. Kestrel Aircraft, Alan Klapmeyer rides again. I'm as almost as excited by Kestrel and what it means as what it means after Kestrel gets done. Watch that space. Alan's got plans. PS Engineering, amazing little company, decided to do one thing and one thing better than anybody else, and that was audio panels. Their new Bluetooth audio panel, which we have in our aircraft, works. It just plain works. And the feature set's amazing. Great little company. Redbird. Redbird has done something with flight simulators we've never seen before. They brought the cost down, the capabilities up. They keep innovating. They're hard charging. They're doing amazing things. Redbird benefits this industry in amazing ways, and I can't wait to see what they do in 2012. Robinson Helicopter. From the amazing R-22 to the 44 to the 66, ingenuity, inventiveness, and tremendous capability have been the watchword of this company, and on top of it, the machines just fly. Society of Aviation and Flight Educators, SAFE, decided there was something wrong with flight instruction. They've got a big job ahead of them. It's not over yet. They keep trying. They're working their hearts out. SAFE makes aviation a better place. Sandell has been doing amazing stuff with their Helitas product, and in particular with a wire mapping application. Let's face it, helicopter pilots are getting hammered because of wire strikes. They're telling you where the wires are now and warning you when you get close by. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Sonics, whether it's little one-seat aircraft that can be done fairly inexpensively, they're two-seaters, or even a single-seat jet, Sonics is putting the sport back into sport aviation, and I love these guys. And finally, SpaceX. American ingenuity, American can do. It's still there. They're still trying, and they're on our side. God bless SpaceX. So that's my list. Tell me what yours is like, and we'll see how the two lists compare. For the Aero News Network, Aero TV, Airborne, I'm Jim Campbell, and oh yeah, happy holidays. Each week we share with you a sample of an online video one of our viewers thought was especially entertaining. We call it AVW, the Aero Video of the Week. Here we come. This week, a fun and very dramatic recreation of a late night encounter with a UFO in the wee hours of Christmas morning. We illuminated in the triple beams of our brilliant landing lights, we saw the mysterious object. A red colored slab 
towed by nine creatures. To find this video, go to YouTube and search for Santa Claus spotted in the Christmas skies. The full video runs seven minutes, 20 seconds long. And if you have a suggestion for a future Aero video of the week, send us a link to news-spy at aero-news.net. Finally this week, NASA now has its own internet radio station. Third Rock, America's Space Station, debuted December 12th with a new rock format in collaboration with Houston-based RFC Media. There's no cost to NASA, and the station will be supported by sponsors looking to recruit for openings in engineering, science, and IT. The program director, a guy named Cruz with no last name, shows real flair with corny DJ puns. He says of the new collaboration, quote, no one knows more about discovering new rock than NASA. Get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. And join us again next week for another edition of Aeroborn here on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. Happy holidays. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.